So, uh, summed up in a nutshell, or as my friend during the conversation which inspired this particular talk, uh, crash course in the Mecca, crash course in the Noble Eightfold Path, crash course in the path to Arahantship, crash course in the direct path to liberation and realization and enlightenment. The talk began completely off of this topic where we were talking about um, raising funds or making money. And uh, I said, actually, uh, for me and for how, what I have understood from my insights, that whether one makes money or whether one sits on a horse or a Harley or a stone or one's own ass or walks on one's feet, it doesn't matter because if one walks on one's feet and desires a Harley or a Rolls Royce or an aeroplane, a jet plane, a Learjet, then one is clinging and one's heart is impure with the stain of desire of clinging to something one can or cannot have. <clears throat> and so uh, one could actually, perhaps, let's say somebody became a mega billionaire and somehow after becoming such and having a palace with a golden roof, suddenly gets an insight and becomes enlightened, becomes a sort of banner or a sagatakami or an anakami or an arahant, even an arahant becomes an arahant. Would then the arahant, that enlightened Buddha, leave the palace? And if so, then why not if an arahant left, a, a normal person left his palace, who a person who is a, a prince or a sheikh in Dubai and left his palace for poverty thinking that was the path to enlightenment and became somehow enlightened as he was living in poverty and realized that the poverty was completely irrelevant, would he then go back to his palace where he had previously lived? I think when clinging is over, and arahantship has been attained. One would cling to neither, and that it would not matter if one is an arahant sitting in a shopping mall, or one is an arahant sitting in the middle of a palace on a throne, because one will have passed beyond caring about such issues and will not even see the existence of such issues in one's heart because one's heart has been purified of such false views and relative, limited, personal views <clears throat> which arise from clinging and wrong knowing. So, I was explaining that uh, I am not yet without desire and still have stains, but that the Buddha taught that if all you have is the atta or the ego and all you have is gilesa, some desires, then trick yourself into using those desires to create the causes of the eventual riddance of precisely those desires and those false views. So when all you have is false view, that's the only tool you have to get rid of false view. When all you have is the khandhas to perceive through, perceive reality through, then that's all you can use to destroy your conditioning. If all you have is conditioning, conditioned views, you have to create different conditioned views, which in combination, when viewed together, make ridicule of all assumptions and destroy all things into emptiness, for example. So I explained to my friend that I use 
this desire which is a stain for a positive reason instead of desiring something for personal use in a sense of personal pleasure a personal satisfaction that will not bring anything to anybody we all seek personal satisfaction unless we're our hands and so where do I seek personal satisfaction I seek personal satisfaction in something that is at least auspicious if not uh, the path then at least auspicious and at least of use to others and will leave me feeling I have done something which leaves me with an auspicious memory of my deeds which allows me to die in peace and so <clears throat> My friend said, uh, I said, I wanted money for this desire. I desire this money and I allowed my desire to be strong because I need a lot of money to build a foundation, an ashram and kind of a monument or a museum of all kinds of things, both worldly and that which points to the unworldly, meaning a museum of Thai Buddha magic, and then uh, an introduction to the Thai Hermit Lucy path and a possibility for few people who may be seriously enough interested to be able to stay and practice that path and deepen and uh, um, make more profound their experience of that path and perhaps then to buy land to expand and make a temple and an enclave for serious practitioners and Buddhist monks to stay and to build monuments and imagery with explanatory texts and placards as well as the Museum of Sacred Yantra which I am collecting so uh, none of this is really for personal luxuries but I will receive a lot of self-satisfaction, which is atta, is impure, and is self-gratification of a temporary manner and false view. But it is, although it is a lokiya dhamma, a worldly dhamma, a worldly phenomenon, not an unworldly, not a alokiya dhamma, the worldly, such as nibbana or Buddhahood, it is an auspicious one, so it is a gusala dhamma, a gusala lokiya dhamma not an agosala dhamma, an inauspicious dhamma. And so this can create further causes in the future of riddance. For now, that's about what I can work with. So my friend replied in Thai, Tam di dai di, tam chua dai chua. Do good, get good back. Do bad, get bad back. It's up to the owner of the deed which is true and it is a reference to the what people call the law of karma laws are uh, concepts invented by humans not since not so long ago since humans called themselves civilized but uh, so maybe law is a harsh word but um, cause and effect you know it's nature people call it science some people call it creation some people call it spiritual it's nature dhamma means nature, the nature of things. Hmm. So, I then, so, excuse me, <coughs> I then uh, thought about this and was thinking about what he asked me before, that why do foreigners um, not seem to get fully there in Thai Buddhism and so I said that's because they're very academic, have a lot of academic knowledge but they very rarely get to get a hold of the the root of it and, and get a taste and get their teeth into it and taste its true taste of the gamatan, of the mindfulness and the insight because insight is where it all comes from any realization comes from insight first and Panya arises with the realization, which is the wisdom mind, the enlightened mind. So I added to what my friend said about doing good, getting good, doing bad, getting bad. And I said, it's not just what you do, 
it's what's in your heart when you're doing it. So um, if you help an old lady across the road because you know she doesn't have any heirs to her fortunes and she might leave it to you, then you're not doing a good deed. You've got a bad thing in your heart. Hmm? And um, so on. So it's what's in your heart, basically, that matters. So I then was thinking about how we were talking that Farang how foreigners don't seem to get what's going on when they ordain in Thailand even and uh, I said this is because one gets and it happens to Thai people it happens to people of any race actually but uh, people assume that Thai people all get it right that's not true very few get it right mm. even those of us who understand it not all of us get it right I get it wrong very often, so, and that's even people who are able to teach can still get it wrong and do. If we didn't get it wrong, then we would be our hands, then wouldn't we? So, continuation and going a little bit more subtle into it, what do you do and what's in your heart? So I talk about uh, when I first disrobed and there was not much in my heart, but I realized I I had to, I knew that I was going to be a father, and so I had to get married. And with a family, you have to present your family with a little bit of normality. You can't just behave like a monk. So I, I disrobed, but in truth, my heart was still practicing. So uh, at the beginning, I would sleep on the floor and... Uh, Cause the problems arose and in the end so one day I was just thinking wow you know I won't sleep on a high place because it's some a vow I took in my heart and then I realized actually you know if my heart is lowly it doesn't matter where I'm sleeping on a mountain top or on a bed or on the floor because if I'm sleeping on the floor I'm on the 14th floor of an apartment block I'm higher than any bed in the first floor so a uh, high or a low really depends more on your own arrogance and your own sense of personal luxury um, consuming luxury uh, and so I just thought as I said an arahant in a shopping mall or an arahant in a cave on a mountain I don't think he would be I think an Iran would be completely indifferent because one is at peace wherever one is and one cannot change the world around oneself. So I think it's more about not clinging to what one is, does, has or has now or had or will have. And so I had to look at myself I'm no fun if I just look at the fridge and I, I have a difficulty to even say what I'd like to eat because it's like a pile of rubble or it was like a pile of rubble mm. and so I was there talking to myself and I'd say you know for your family you've got to try and uh, recultivate these things you've spent so long destroying but uh, may, perhaps you can allow them to happen in a balanced way and, and still destroy them and re-destroy them in a, as time goes along as time allows and make this an act of renunciation, renunciation to slow down and so uh, to stay as a monk would be to keep doing what I wanted to do but to disrobe and look after family and renounce what I wanted to do was an act of renunciation and if I didn't do that I would be egoistic and so staying a monk was actually less an act of renunciation or would have been than was disrobing and so even disrobing itself can be an act of practice if you wish to transform it into such a thing or it can be an act of um, defeatedness or an act of defeat, a statement of defeat, of giving up, or it can be for many other reasons, some of which I can and some of which I cannot 
imagine. When one tries to recultivate the desire to open a refrigerator and feel excitement or to be able to show joy or comment uh, with joy or with some kind of pleasure about food or such other things which are trends for most people or sources of entertainment and which for a monk or a practitioner or an ascetic are actually just uh, to seek entertainment in such a thing as something like a dog would chase his tail uh, that becomes a point in one's practice where that becomes ridiculous and it is simply a, a source of energy with which to keep away the Vedana and I think w when you try to recultivate something I say okay I should get excited and you look you open the refrigerator and you see a piece of cheese and you see a bar of chocolate and you see some rice and you're looking and yeah you prefer one thing over the other a little bit and so you're thinking well that will be easier to eat and that will nourish me more and different reasons push you and pull you one way or the other and then you find yourself thinking or I found myself and find myself thinking What's this that's pushing me? What's making me choose this and not that? And why do I think I'm just eating for energy, but I still have a preference? And I look and I see, yeah. Well, actually sometimes it's a preference, and sometimes it's not a preference, just logic. The logic, what is it? The logic is, well, I'm not too healthy, I don't get much exercise, that's got vegetables in it, it's got vitamins, but easier to digest. That's a reason to choose that over the other. Well, there's a selfishness in that, it's more subtle. But there's also a, I will need to preserve myself to liberate myself in time before my death. And so, all of these reasons pushing. <coughs> If the reason is, well, that's because I really like cheese more than chocolate, um, that's because one really believes in cheese and really believes in chocolate. Uh, for some people, that has ceased to exist as such. It is seen and it is called cheese, but it is not, doesn't have such a solidity. So, uh, some of these, I find myself thinking, well, these thoughts which are not based in entertainment but are based in logical thought. I was thinking about the Buddhas and the Arahants. If they are completely free of all clinging, what makes them stand up in the morning? What makes them decide to go out and answer questions? Or what makes them decide to agree or disagree to something? They must have some kind of motivational force. And so I thought about that, how sometimes I react to food with desire and wrong view, and sometimes I just react to it, make a decision based on logical thought. The logical thought decisions is probably what happens in the mind of the enlightened ones, that they do not base their decisions or motivations on personal satisfaction rather than the general good and benefit of all not just beings but the world of everything and without bias whereas the times I reacted with desire or really believing in porridge or really believing in cookies was because I had waited so long that my body had begun to cry out and was hungry physically and therefore vitana the second kanda, or the one that is counted second in the theoretical list of the academics. Emotion, mood. And so this mood uh, blurs and drunkens my mind. And then I begin to see pizza as pizza, and it looks delicious, and it starts to take on all of these pleasure-pleasing 
effects and memories arise of previous experiences in my first sight or first smell of pizza and how the cliché of pizza should be in one's mind. And one is lost in illusion, wrong view, unenlightened. That is one's vittana has begun to arise. The monks practice patisankayo niso bintapatang patisewami. That is, uh, we practice not for self-entertainment or temporary pleasure, but to just keep away the suffering and the vetana, the mood and emotion and reaction to that suffering, which will make our minds blurred and allow not allow us to practice properly and to see things and contemplate properly because the mind will be uh, befuddled by such and will be lost in simple animalistic actions, the desire to seek food and one can even get vicious if one is hungry enough so it can truly affect one's behavior so I looked and I saw the two ways of how I can react to food and this let me know that this thing which causes me to behave and to be influenced by this particular thing, uh, this particular Dhamma, is a cause or is a root within, a wrong view, one of the roots, one of the parts of the root. And I see which part is gone and that what is gone is gone and that what has no cause for reappearance will ever, won't ever reappear. And what is not yet gone, is not yet gone. And what is still a cause for reappearance, will continue to reappear. And this means what one is still attached to, and one is not attached to anymore. That means whether we choose cheese, or chocolate when we open the refrigerator door and what causes us to choose if not the gilesa and the michatiti michatiti is wrong view desire and clinging and wrong view sometimes so then I consider myself as only seeing food as energy like filling the gas tank of a car and that I eat not for entertainment or pleasure or in temporary fulfillment rather solely for the alleviation of hunger for when hunger arises vetana arises the mood and the suffering that wind or wave of mood which controls our minds so to keep vetana at bay in order to keep practicing, we eat. We eat our medicine, for it is indeed like medicine. Medicine to keep suffering at bay. We breathe the air, which is also our medicine. If we don't breathe air, then we die very quickly, even faster than if we do not eat or drink. We are indeed addicts to air. My friend commented that one eats to alleviate the pangs of hunger and not create new feelings of being overly fed. To be overly fed is also suffering, and to be underly fed is also suffering. There lies what was meant by the enlightened one as the middle path, part of the middle path. The main thing, or the important part of practice, and this is what the foreign monks get wrong and foreign practitioners often get wrong is that the main thing and the important part is not to become adept at all the various techniques which a monk and a practitioner must master such as meditation, diligence, patience and various other qualities and faculties of mind and of um, physical, how long carries oneself and how one walks and how one uh, restrains oneself uh, 
that is not the goal. Those are practices of restraint and practices of uh, development which strengthen the causes of liberation and enlightenment, but the, they are not the goal. And many foreign monks, and Thai monks, and practitioners everywhere get it wrong and get lost in the practice of trying to master all the practices. The main thing or the important part is to become awakened. To become awakened is what we are aiming for, not to be seen as the best masters of meditation or such things as that. <clears throat> What is important is not how many times one eats or how much one eats, rather what is in one's heart when one eats and when one does everything, when one speaks and when one thinks of others and when one does one's deeds throughout the day. What is important for to obtain the path and what is important is to obtain the path of the enlightened ones is that one has to practice watching watching oneself and seeing within. One has to pra practice seeing one's inclinations, one's tendencies and all of the things that one is clinging to and also be aware of that which one is not clinging to and that which one has clung to and no longer clings to if perhaps one has already achieved this in any way. One should look within and learn to see the desire that is motivating us, that is making us choose chocolate over cheese, that is making us answer a person in this way instead of that way, and making us choose between all of the potential choices which we can make in life. <clears throat> One should also seek how much free will is involved in that and how many influencing factors are involved in our decisions, and how, including the subtle ones. And one should contemplate how subtle influences can one find in that. And there is where one will find various levels of that which I call stains, or impurity, or that which obscures the crystal clear surface of our consciousness, that which some religions call the soul, that which Buddhism says is not a soul and is not self, but is. It is just not anything in particular, in a particular way at a particular time. It is constantly changing and therefore is not self, has no constant. It is constantly changing, that is the only constant. So to be awakened and watchful of what is happening within oneself, inside, and to dwell within the mood and the mind and the reactions which occur within the mind to every thought and see how those thoughts result in reactions and those reactions result in a mood, a good mood, a bad mood, like or dislike. And that what lies between the thought and the reaction is memory, sanya, the third kanda, and part of our perception. Sanya, the thing that makes us not like it, it reminds us of something we don't like. A more, one, a subtle, an obvious, or many ways. That hence pushes us forward into making further decisions and choices and we perform various actions, be they auspicious actions or inauspicious, not auspicious actions. So where does the free will lie in all of that? Hmm? Nowhere, of course, except in the mind of the unenlightened ones. Oh, I mean nowhere at all in the mind of the unenlightened ones and perhaps only, if elsewhere or anywhere at all, then only in the mind of the enlightened ones can one find any free will at all. <coughs> when one has renounced the will of the false self, the Atta, 
then one can truly have free will because one is free of the influences of the false self, of the Atta. So, catch 22. We see animals, and we even call them dumb animals, and their instincts, which they seem to obey, as something pitiable, something to be pitied. And we see, or many of us see, that animals are completely under the control of their insti instincts and not able to escape such influences. But in truth, <coughs> we humans in this present age, those of us who are unenlightened, which means almost all of us, we are precisely the same. We're not really any different. It's just that instead of bones like the dogs have and holes under trees and all of the different smelly or weird things what seem weird to us, what animals have, we have cinemas and shopping malls and amusement parks and those kind of things and smartphones. But actually we are still in principle and in the most primordial sense influenced and driven by precisely the same thing. Even the smells and places to make one's mark which the animals have and their territorial behavior you can find even in modern city society if you really really choose to consider and observe it. <clears throat> we're all running around entertaining ourselves and we're seeking entertainment in temporary pleasures flitting from one thing to the other from birth to death and that's not much different from the animals we're chasing our tails and we're looking outside of ourselves. Mm. or as <clears throat> the poet and uh, beatnik Jim Morrison once said we're reaching for death at the end of a candle. We're searching for something that's already found us. Be it a Buddhist Lama retreat, collecting stamps, or even Buddhist amulets, or be it a go to church on Sunday, or be it a sports, or be it meditation, or, you know, a lot of stuff, uh, then it's just really, for most people, entertainment, and not really considered to be stepping towards the Mecca, because most people have never seen the Mecca. And the Mecca is to do with stains, and no stains that which is in the world and that which is not in the world that which is going to return to the world and that which is never to return again that which is born and that which is unborn that which must die and that which is deathless that which is in the process of becoming and that which is in the pro is never becoming that which is clinging and that which knows no clinging. That which is limited and that which is beyond all limits. There are two different things. <clears throat> One thing is worldly and that contains all things that we know. And the other thing is unworldly and that does not contain anything because it's uncontainable and is not contained by anything because it is boundless and formless and immaterial and cannot be contained. But there are two things. There is not is and is not. There is the world and there is Nibbana. Nibbana is not something that is not. Nibbana is something that is. Enlightenment is not something that is not. Enlightenment is something that is. Enlightenment is Nibbana. Nibbana means peace. Peace means stillness. Stillness means non-action. Stillness means complete peace. Stillness means 
no chattering, listening, seeing. Stillness means awakened mind, observing, mindful, knowing, seeing, hearing, spontaneously being, not becoming, lost in becoming, never getting to be something, just running between one thing and the other. That is where we humans stand in samsara, in illusion, in illusory, the world of illusory thought. We perceive not outside the boundaries of this world because of the limits of our illusory thought. As this conversation reached this point with my friend and this matter was brought up, my friend commented that as he had tried to understand how free will and karma exist simultaneously, free will is to him how one reacts to the karma being dealt however it is dealt and which then either alleviates further karma or creates more and hence is cyclic. And so I replied that if one reacts with avicca, avicca means wrong view, uh, wrong knowledge and wrong view and wrong belief, and this is what we have of course, <coughs> then uh, one does not really have much free will because one is reacting with false things which are influencing one and if one reacts without avicca, without false view then one does not react to it at all so uh, free will and karma exist simultaneously uh, if one has free will my friend postulated uh, free will is depends, if one has free will, depends on how you react to how your karma is dealt out or how the world hits you, how you like the world. So if you like it or don't like it, you're reacting to the world mm, when it hits your face every day. Uh, my friend postulated that... Uh, being enlightened or unenlightened or having free will or not free will, which is the same in principle as I have earlier tried to explain and hopefully have explained for some, hopefully have understood uh, that my friend postulated that if one reacted in a bad way then one is with wrong view and without free will, sorry, which for me is wrong view, influenced by wrong view and unenlightened. And that if one reacts well to it, then one is with free will, because one chooses the positive option with wisdom. Um, it's for sure wiser, but it's worldly wiser, it's wiser for egoistic reasons. And so therefore, it's also reaction and it's a reaction based on like and not like. Uh, both of these reactions, any kind of reaction to how karma is dealt out or to how the world appears to you or how you get on with people or how you like your day or how the weather is or whatever, hmm? they are all reactions. Now an arahant or somebody who is enlightened, somebody without avicca, without false view, we have wicca, which is right view, and avicca is false view. Wicca is used in Thailand for occult sciences and also for sciences and subjects in school. But actually, there is only one real wicca, and there is many kinds of avicca. Wicca is wrong belief and wrong view, and the enlightened no knowledge of the true nature of things that is right view which is our handship, which is Buddhahood, which is purity and liberation. Mm. So, basically, how one reacts 
to karma. If one reacts, then one reacts with avicca. <clears throat> because if one does not have, if one is without avicca, one does not react within that at all, and one does not have any reaction within oneself. So there is only reaction and non-reaction. Without avicca, the cause of dependent origination, or in Pali, paditya samupad, paditya samupada, then the first cause is not present anymore. And so there would be no reaction in the mind and the heart of an arahant to however the karma is dealt out. Therefore, we can only have unenlightened beings who have karma reacting to that karma with avicca, with wrong view. And, on the other hand, we have enlightened beings who are without karma, cause and effect, and they are not reacting to karma. With vicha, huh? we have unenlightened beings reacting to their karma with avicca, and we have enlightened beings without karma not reacting to it with vicha. Because of vicha, they are not reacting to their karma and they don't have any karma because they are without reaction and they are, are without cause. But unenlightened beings have karma, they make karma because they react to it, which is a cause and it's also an effect. And they are caught within that wheel because of avicca. So one more time, therefore we have only unenlightened beings who are with karma, reacting to that karma with avicca. And then we have enlightened beings who are without karma and not reacting to that karma with avicca. With because 